Okay, um, we're just going to get started. And today the talk or the panel is going to be about um, the technical obstacles to why there's no widespread adoption of crypto today. And it's pretty obvious that over the last year or year and a half, we went from people, very few people knowing about what blockchain is or cryptocurrency or Bitcoin or Ethereum to basically the whole world figuring out what this thing is. So we've gotten to definitely widespread awareness, but no one's actually using it day to day. And so we're going to be talking about some of the things that are keeping us from using it day to day. And it starts from like the technology layer that's actually preventing a lot of the adoption today. Um, but before we go on to that, I want to go do a round of intros. And I'll start with uh, you, Richard. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> hi, everybody. So, uh, I am um, an engineer who was never good enough to be a developer, uh, trained in, in the UK and Cambridge, and um, then I got into building software companies and did a couple of those quite on the kind of plumbing side of things. Um, uh, one IPO and then one trade sale, and then 10 years ago crossed over to the other side of the table, and for a couple of years was really looking for uh, something that really got me excited, that there was something transformative happening to quote Peter Thiel, to move beyond the 140 characters of, of Twitter and get to flying cars. And I think that um, the combination of, of crypto and AI and, and Internet of Things is actually possibly getting us there. And, and Fabric is investing in, in that new wave of computing. Vinay? Uh, so I'm Vinay Gupta, CEO of Materium. Um, uh, uh, like Richard, also a developer. Uh, I stayed in software, then went into energy policy for a while. Came back to software in 2014 when I joined the Ethereum team, uh, led the launch of Ethereum, um, and uh, now run a company which basically exists to handle the legal side of blockchain adoption. Awesome. Joe? I'm Joey Krug. I'm co-CIO at Pantera Capital. We're an investment firm that solely focuses on blockchain tech. And then uh, before that, how I originally got involved in this space is I created a project called Augur, uh, which is a decentralized prediction market on top of Ethereum. Awesome. Um, and I'm uh, Preeti Kasreddy. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called True Story. We're building a social network for experts to identify what's true and what's not, starting with information in crypto. And before this, I was an engineer at Coinbase and a partner at Andrews and Horowitz. So I'm just going to get started. And like I said, one of the biggest things that we're facing today is there's lack of adoption in crypto. So we all know about it, but no one's actually using it. And we have these like big dreams for what this thing can do for us. But the technology that we have to get us to this big dream basically is at an infancy state. It's like, it's like Elon Musk trying to go to space, but all he has is a horse and buggy. That's kind of the state we are in crypto. And we need to get this horse and buggy to a spaceship to really get to the space. Um, so I want to kind of start off by asking you, what do you think are the, what do you feel are the biggest technical obstacles that are preventing um, widespread adoption from happening today? Um, so in a sense, I'd say I don't think there are any technical obstacles because I'd really like to kind of reframe the, the conversation a little bit. Yeah. Um, uh, partly because I think we can get dragged into quite a lot of detail about how to solve things like scaling uh, or different consensus mechanisms. Uh, and that's really work that is probably best discussed in another forum in some senses. Um, but in as much as user experience is actually you know, technically you know, very challenging to get right, I think a lot of that, uh, the, the challenges exist in that space. Um, uh, whether it be um, the fact that you don't want to be trying to remember your seed phrase or remember your private key or have to manually do a test transaction, all of that should kind of really be handled by uh, your wallet, for example. And there are companies like Argent and Casa and, and Keyless and so forth sort of uh, trying to address that. But I just uh, uh, one sort of additional point is that if we step back and I think about some of the experiences I've had in trying to build companies and, and failing for long periods of time to get them to take off, um, the challenge of actually building a product that is, is you know, delicious enough to be adopted by users and that then cracking the code of how you take that to market is really tough. You have to get consumers to get over some kind of discomfort and create a new habit. And in the enterprise space, 
uh, you've got to get to the top of the list of priorities, preferably of the CFO, not of the head of some other department. So this takes real serious effort and concentration, and it's many of the reasons that venture capital exists, and that even when all of the tech is baked, you still you know, get a few victories out of several tens, if you, if you see what I mean. So I yeah. think that's, that's my feeling about it. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Like, I think if you look at the experiences that Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest or all these consumer products have created for us, they've done such a phenomenal job of creating really, really good products that the crypto, cons crypto products today are not competing with other crypto products. They're, con they're competing with centralized counterparts, which is a really, really, really high barrier to, to meet. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so so I think that some of this is also just a question of time. Um, <clears throat> uh, I remember installing the first version of the software that runs the web, CERN HGTV, on university machines in 93, and I don't think the web became generally useful until about 2008. You know, the, the point where it was just de facto, it was a generational process. Yeah. And I think crypto is a generational process. Um, when the kids that are currently in high school trading Bitcoin are you know, middle management in airlines, that's when you'll begin to see talk of like, well, you know, why aren't we selling tickets for Bitcoin? You know, why aren't we putting these tickets on a blockchain? Why is there a secondary market? The modes of thinking take a long time to soak into the culture. Um, but we've already seen mass adoption of crypto once, which was e-commerce, right? You know, the little green padlock is an indicator of a crypto legal underlying system. And that's two and a half tr trillion dollars of transactions a year right now. So it's not that we're not using crypto, we're all using it all the time. It's just how long will it take people to get more crypto? Uh, and I think the web browser is the critical battleground. I think Brave is super important, um, but then who's using it? Yeah, I would say one thing, um, if you look at the user experience issues in this space, um, about half of them, I think, are things that you can fix today, uh, like those wallet problems that you mentioned are, are solvable today. I think the other half, though, do actually go back to the technical scalability issues. And the reason is, um, if you think of a regular web startup, you can kind of get some traction and then run into a scalability wall, wall or barrier. So a good example of this is Twitter. Uh, for the first, like, five years of Twitter, the fail whale was up on the site all the time because the site kept crashing. And they just kept spinning up more servers. And, and eventually, they improved their infrastructure. And, and now it doesn't crash all the time. Um, but in cryptocurrency, a lot of the interesting applications are actually marketplaces. In particular, they're financial marketplaces. And so for those, it's really hard to even get to the point where you hit uh, that first scalability barrier because to market make in marketplaces requires massive amounts of scale. So if you think of a trading firm on Wall Street, and they're providing liquidity to some financial market, they're placing and canceling uh, hundreds of thousands of, of orders in that market um, on a scale of a few seconds. And so if you don't have the ability to actually do things like market make, it makes it hard for even um, the smallest amount of, of, of actual usage to start to take off. Mm -hmm. And so I do think some of these, these scalability problems on the tech side do need to be solved before we start to see um, you know, e even kind of small, nascent amounts of adoption for some of these applications. So, I mean, clearly I'm not, just to you know, respond and throw it around a little bit, if, that, if that's okay. I mean, clearly I'm not saying that we uh, don't need to solve those problems, but it, an interesting question would be, um, I mean, first of all, how many people in the audience are developing what you might think of as a decentralized application? I don't know if there's a show of hands. Anybody? A few, a few people? Hands, a few hands. Oh, yeah, how many people are actually developing an application? OK, so we maybe had 50% of the people developing an application. But I would wager that there aren't many um, of, of those people out there who are immediately running into the scalability problem. So it needs to be solved. But you know, they're probably running into the problem of building, indeed, marketplaces, which even, even if it's just an information arbitrage business you're going into with a marketplace, it's, it's tough to get the two sides you know, going. But the opportunity that exists um, with you know, new ways of representing data that are embodied in something like you know, blockchain and, and expressed through crypto, the opportunities there are, are moved beyond information arbitrage. It's like, you know, it's like entirely new information businesses around you know, whether it be real estate or indeed around uh, finance. And so those are even harder to, to, to bootstrap into to existence. I think I'm sort of 
maybe complacent, but I think that the, kind of the guys, in, whether it be Ethereum or other projects, will continue to crack the scaling side of things. We need to focus on you know, what are the right problems to solve right now and, and, uh, and be really smart about that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think either of you are wrong. I think sure. both, both are problems. Like, you can't have, like, I think if anything we've learned over the last couple of years, it's that the, the if, like, decentralized applications are not the only form of applica applications, right? ICOs are an application. And the, the ICOs made us realize that actually we don't even have the tech to scale this thing that we dream of. And so now we're back at the infrastructure phase and we're like, okay, let's fix the infrastructure so we can do more apps. I think it's just like this recurring cycle where we'll, we'll try to build apps like ICOs or other things and then we'll realize the infrastructure is not there and then we'll, we'll fix that and we'll build applications. So it's both, um, yeah. they go hand in hand. I had a very funny conversation uh, with my uncle James Young, who was the scaling engineer for Farmville. <clears throat> and he said in those days, you know, most of the social games had to provision their own servers, but Farmville was an early adopter of Amazon Web Services. Yeah. So what would happen is the game would go viral, then they'd hit a capacity yeah. stall, then the virality would stop, and then, uh, but for Farmville, they just kept phoning Amazon and asking for more servers. Yeah. So I think part of the slowing of growth is that when you do get a viral spike, Ethereum does tend to grind to a halt, yeah. like CryptoKitties, right? CryptoKitties might have reached 10 times as many people, 50 times as many people, if it hadn't downed the network on the way up. And it's not like you could just call Amazon to do some more provisioning. So th there is this possibility that we're going to be in a position where we get stop starts with virality, yeah. you know, up until we hit a critical mass of scaled solution. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I have reasonable hopes that the scaling will come to kind of like a thousand transactions a second. Yeah. I think you could get there without having to do a scratch from, rewrite. From what would we say today? From like 15, a day, 15 a second now? Is that yeah, 15 to a give second. a context for people? So, yeah. yeah, yeah, 15 a second now. So that I think that you could get linear approaches to getting to about a thousand. But if you want to get kind of OLTP style visa throughput, 130,000 transactions a second, I, th I think for that, it's not clear that anything in the blockchain space has a realistic shot at that while remaining decentralized. Right. Um, kind of moving on to that, like what are the current solutions that you're seeing that people are trying to put in place to solve the scalability problems? Because there's so many different angles that people are taking at this right now, whether that's uh, scaling the chain, base chain itself or building on layer two, like various layer two scaling solutions or just building whole new consensus engines that are optimized for more scalability but like less security per se. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would say you have basically kind of two uh, wide ranges of approaches. You have people trying to scale things linearly, uh, as Vinay mentioned. And I, I think he's right. We can get a 100x inc increase in performance doing that. Um, and then the other way is, is kind of exponentially or, or quadratically. And so the ideas there are, if you look at blockchains today, um, they're like a really dumb calculator, where if you put in your calculator 2 plus 2, <coughs> everyone else in the world, everyone's calculator, all of a sudden does 2 plus 2 and, and shows 4 on the screen. Uh, and that's kind of how it works today. And so people are working on trying to create solutions where um, you don't need every calculator to process every calculation somebody inputs into it. And those are the ones where you, know, you could theoretically see hundreds of thousands of transactions per second, but they're also much more technically difficult. Um, those areas are really still in R&D today. Yeah, and it's fair to say that you know, with those approaches, you, you make some compromise with kind of like you know, speed to finality of a transaction or the lever of security or privacy. And there's a, a trade-off that goes goes on, and <clears throat> so the answer in my sense to your question is, you know, yes, all of those things, different approaches are, uh, are gonna be, um, uh, play out, and then depending on the use cases that hopefully people do focus on as well, then, you know, you'll use the, the appropriate back-end infrastructure. <clears throat> and indeed, there'll be an interplay between these different blockchains or, or ledgers, um, you know, so that they'll use each other as side chains, if, if you will. Yeah. 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 And, I mean, I think that with this, um, <clears throat> A lot of this is about understanding what the technology is for. <clears throat> like to me, the current Ethereum main chain looks more or less perfect for DNS type functions. 
It's great for key management. It's great for figuring out where an asset is to be found. But if you're doing serious transaction throughput, you kind of need to move to an L2 solution. So because we got it into our head that the main chain is where you want all your transactions to happen, we keep kind of banging our head against that rather than using the main chain for namespace management, key management, you know, dereferencing to other solutions, and then running the transactions on those systems. So I, I think that this is in some ways a cultural shift where we have to accept that you know, if you've got a sort of you know, 50 signer subchain that has a whole bunch of proof of authority stuff on it, and you've got smooth interoperability with main chain, that may not be a temporary solution, that may be the solution. Yeah. Uh, because a full scale, you know, full blood, heterogeneous parallel computing surface for the entire internet, that's a big ask, yeah. right? It's not clear that we can get there from here. Uh, you might have to go back to the kind of 1980s style thinking about concurrent sequential processes and pod calculus and all that stuff. And most of the people that really understand that stuff are 15 years older than me. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it's, we're waiting for another revolution, but it, you know, it may be a bunch of old guys. Yeah, I think you make a really good point there in that like people culturally are still thinking of blockchain, like, like the, the fact that people think that everything needs to live on the blockchain, yeah. and it doesn't. Like, not everything needs to live in this slow, censorship-resistant, immutable blockchain. The only things you probably want to keep in there are the ones that require the properties of censorship-resistant, yeah. privacy. Um, like, those are the, like, those are the only things that need to live on the blockchain. Everything else can live off the blockchain. And so I think my thesis is that layer two solutions or application-specific blockchains make a lot more sense, so long as you can always peg to the main blockchain and transact with the main blockchain. Yeah. Um, so personally, for example, on True Story, we're building on something called Cosmos, which allows us to do that. It allows us to build an application-specific blockchain where we, uh, we don't have to be boggled down by the throughput of Ethereum because we have our own blockchain. But then we can always peg to the Ethereum blockchain when we need to um, go to the main chain. And so these are the types of solutions that are being built. And I think we're still in early days we're still figuring out what is the right way to do it and what is the wrong way to do it. And the only way to figure that out is to keep trying things and testing it out. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, I kind of want to move on to asking you, like, we're seeing this whole battle happening between like Ethereum blockchain and Bitcoin blockchain and EOS and uh, Tezos. And so you, you're starting to see a multi-blockchain world and a lot of competition among blockchains. Do you believe in a single blockchain future, or do you think there'll be many, many, many blockchains? So, I mean, as mentioned, I, I kind of believe in the, the blooming of a, a thousand blockchains or, or blockchain type, you know, technologies. Um, but uh, that said, you know, it's clear that you know, watching the activity in the developer community and seeing the success of Ethereum is is, is the right set of metrics to be looking at. And I think at the moment, it's still. It's growing um, in terms of number of repos. The f it's the fifth fastest, roughly growing on GitHub. Where kind of Azure would be, uh, you know, on top in terms of type. So I think I think that's uh, you know relevant to look at that. But nonetheless, I think the whole community within Ethereum, and, and we can throw around kind of what size we think it is. But it's it, it's less than a million developers, clearly, um, maybe less than half a million. Whereas you know I would I would say depending on how you define developer, you've got to be punching towards a hundred million developers around the world, mm -hmm. um, and maybe that, you know, that's growing quite fast. So it's still a small, you know, it's the foothills of its kind of potential growth. So there's a lot of possibilities for that, that, that position of uh, uh, you know, uh, primacy to change o over time. So, and so I, th I wouldn't, for that reason, be dismissing other approaches. Yeah. I think in some ways it's more important to think about the wallets than the underlying chains. Um, you, know, you could easily see a situation in which you wind up with a, a near monopoly wallet where you just wind up with one front end and pretty much all of the crypto stuff is in that front end. Uh, I don't think the users particularly care because you know, if you ask them to differenti differentiate between Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a bunch of other stuff, eh, you know, for, for most sure. users, it's numbers that go up and numbers that go down. And either your friend takes it or your friend doesn't. Um, so I'm, I think I'm much more interested in the front ends and the wallets and the development of the user interface concepts. Like, I feel like we still haven't had the breakthrough on interface. Yeah. All the blockchain stuff still looks like kind of third-rate banking applications, rather than like, ooh, look, it's a supercomputer. And we, and we don't even like the first-rate banking applications. So, oh, God. God. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Monzo's not bad, oh, yeah. right? But, but some of the new it's ones. Only yeah, yeah, bad, right? yeah, yeah, it's only yeah. not bad, right? It's only not bad. Like, why isn't finance fun? Yeah. 
uh, yeah, and like I think when you think about a blockchain, a blockchain is a distributed system. In a distributed system, you can't get all the properties. You can never have a perfect distributed system. So you're always making trade-offs, whether you want more security, less security, more scalability, less scalability. And so I think every blockchain will probably optimize for a certain thing and build for that. And so you can't ever have a blockchain that does everything. That's, sure. that's just my thesis. Mm -hmm. And so even though people give, for example, projects like EOS a lot of shit for being centralized, I think it does serve some use cases. Because maybe gaming doesn't actually require, sen doesn't need censorship res resistance, and that's enough for gaming, right? Sure. I mean, and I was so going to say that um, there's definitely, of course, and this happens if you, you know, see these generational shifts um, driven by new technologies, you know, you definitely get the, some of the earlier protagonists and adopters being pretty religious about the use of those technologies and the approach. And clearly, people have religion about decentralization. Yeah. And um, definitely what we've started to, to see and reflect in the way we're looking at opportunities is people who think about not just minimal viable product, but um, when they're getting going, but also minimal viable decentralization, a minimal viable you know, use of crypto, um, you know, and, and be much more pragmatic about that, even to the degree that people might think about from a fresh start, I want to disrupt this marketplace. I want it to be a very information, data intensive marketplace that I'm going to build. But I'm not ready. I don't need to use crypto and, and decentralization day one. There's other problems for me to, for me to tackle. And so you might but say, for example, in a healthcare use case, you might say the most critical thing, thing is just the privacy of the data. Um, and, and I need to use you know, some of these fresh technologies, uh, for example, zero knowledge proofs, to, to address that particular problem. Yeah. But the level of decentralization, that's something that can perhaps evolve over time. Yep. Uh. Yeah. I, I think that's a good point about zero knowledge proofs. Like, I sort of feel like we're about to enter this kind of Cambrian explosion of new algorithms. Yeah. You know, there are, there are all kinds of new things kind of crawling out of the mathematical research with the ring signatures and various kinds of zero knowledge proofs. And, ZK Starks and Starks and all the rest of that. So it may be that in two or three years, blockchain is one of half a dozen crazy things that happen in cryptography yeah. that are now running around on the internet. Yeah. Uh, I think that the Stark thing is so shatteringly powerful. Yeah. I mean, it's a jaw-dropping set of mathematical innovations. Uh, I think it's going to tear reality wide open. Um, I mean, on my front, the, the angle that we're working on is not so much the trade-offs in, in the pure digital domain, but how do we break out into the real world so that you could get hold of assets? And it's kind of like namespace management, right? We've got all this work which is happening on digital identity for people. A unified digital identity standard, blockchain or not, would be a game changer. Same thing for assets like houses and cars and all the rest of that stuff. Just being able to internet route your way to physical assets to move them around, or internet route your way to somebody's legal identity to serve them with papers, this kind of stuff. That's also transformative for the blockchain space. It's scaling, but it's not scaling in the pure technical. It's reaching out into different parts of people's lives, into their identity, into their billing, into their banking, you know, into their health records. So it may be that it's as much as scaling outwards as just raw more transactions, just different areas of life that finally become kind of digital. Because we did shopping, right? We yeah. did shopping and we did hanging out with your friends. But those are, that was the last revolution, right? We haven't had the next jump. But I mean, on that point of what we've done, done though, I mean, if you look at the, the stats and actually try and work out where we are in the potential digitalization of the world, mm. and even if you take kind of e-commerce and retail consumer yeah, spending, yeah. it's still, it's some you know, single digit percentage of the, of the world's consumer oh, yeah. spending. Two, two, and been, half, two and a half percent of world trade. digitized. Yeah. So, and that, that's because a lot of those other categories um, you know, are much more complex to, to digitize. And, and that's some of the opportunity, but obviously yeah. you know, also the challenge. Even advertising, you know, if you narrowly define advertising, then maybe it's heading towards 50% of advertising spends on online, something like that. But if you include kind of like you know dropping mail into your yeah. into your door door and so forth, then it's actually again you know probably single digits. So it's much lower. Yeah. So there's still a long way to it's go. A, it's early days. I mean, the B2B space has nothing at all. Like you know, wearing my Materium hat. You know, we're just chiseling away on what do you need to get B2B to work for e-commerce. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because e-commerce is practically zero B2B. There's almost nothing yeah, there. Yeah, you know, exactly. Uh, and we know that there's an explosion waiting to happen. And the question is, blockchain the necessary enabling technology for that explosion or not? And, and it, we think it is. Yeah, and we, and we see some people in that e-commerce space, all kind of B2B e-commerce, mm -hmm. you know, again, starting very pragmatically. 
So thinking like down to kind of the kind of fundamental building blocks of, of e-commerce, say like an, an invoice, and seeing for some set of invoices in some industry, yeah. Yeah. let me re, re instantiate that um, as you know a smart contract, and and then start from that fundamental building block, and then and then work up. And I think you could start in many different places, rather than saying you know from from the get-go we're going to just take this in, entire industry and transform the entire supply chain, which is just by definition uh, tough. Yeah. I want to say something about ICOs, actually. If I, is that okay? Is that okay? So yeah, indeed, that was an application pretty popular. So we talk about adoption. Uh, it got pretty popular, at least amongst a certain segment. Uh, and indeed, um, maybe presented some scaling problems from time to time. But it also, of course, presented some regulatory problems. Uh, it's, I mean, we st I still think that you know, alongside venture, you know, but also in different stages of investment, it's not going away, the ability to kind of crowdfund like that, but obviously uh, you know, regulated. But I also think that you know, what we see is that there's still a huge potential for different types of financial application. Um, that that you know, what 30% of the world is, is, is unbanked entirely, and probably 30% of, of the US is essentially unbanked even, uh, or unfairly banked, perhaps. Um, and, and that we see both on the consumer side and then on the retail side a lot of innovation going on now driven by the crypto capital markets when people realize that they can do things uh, differently. Uh, I think we shouldn't just like, you know, forget that bit and then be hunting for uh, supply chain or medical use cases. Um, we can do that as well, but let's not forget sort of the capital markets. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to jump into a couple of questions from the audience. And one of the ones is asking, when do you think it's too late for mainstream adoption? When? Is that yeah. a question? I mean, like, over a decade from now. Um, it's, it's still so early. Um, I guess one, one thing on the point about, you know, people are always saying, well, you can make the trade-offs between, you know, scalability and security and all this stuff. I think we're so early that it's almost slightly too early to even discuss those trade-offs. It would be like talking about, you know, tr trade-offs on the speed side of the internet back before dial-up even existed. Um, back during that time, you, you should have actually just focused on laying more wire in solving the, the huge infrastructure problems as opposed to making trade-offs. And so to route that back to, you know, when was it too late for mainstream stuff, I mean, this tech is still so early. I, I view Bitcoin almost as like the ARPANET uh, equivalent in this analogy. You know, Bit, uh, Ethereum's maybe the, the very early internet, and Ethereum's only been out a few years, um, so it's, it's, uh, it's still like day zero. Go for Yeah, to build on that, I would say that, that it was about, what, 85 that Cisco Systems was founded, I think, a um, couple of Stanford uh, folks, and, and, they, and they, the, I think, as I understand it, if you're going to boil it down, you know, the, ultimately, Cisco sold most of the kit that went into building the internet, the, that then enabled the web as an application running on top of it. But at the time, the thing that stood out was that they made these relatively cost-effective multi-protocol routers. Now, who gave a damn about the fact that they were really good at building multi-protocol routers you know, then, let alone you know, 10, 10 years later? But we're still at that stage yep. that, that people are building those kind, of, those kind of products. Took 10 years then to get to the Netscape Escape IPO. I'm going to take a slightly contrarian view, and I'm going to say I don't think it's ever too late because I see, two, I see crypto playing out in two ways. Either it does get to mainstream adoption or it remains very, very niche. And I, don't think it, I just don't think it ever dies, though. It, got, that's the beauty of this system. To, it just never actually dies. To, to, to um, badly misquote kind of Arthur C. Clarke or whatever, which maybe another way of thinking about it, that all the kind of most powerful technologies are you know, most useful once they become invisible, and that you want to move into the kind of Carlotta Perez phase of deployment in these technology ways where it's, it's just super widely spread. Um, so it doesn't die. It just kind of just becomes ubiquitous. Yes, uh, kind of like AI. Yeah. Like AI has just like yeah. creeped us underneath us without even realizing. It's not yeah. like you, you, you go in and plug into an AI solution every day. It just it powers your life. And maybe that's how crypto takes off too. It just creeps into our lives slowly. Well, it raises an interesting point because the, that is the case about AI. And there's a lot of debate now about ethical AI and about whether or not you yeah. want to allow AI to pervert our emotions and therefore possibly political outcomes. And I think part of this whole discussion is how the combination of these technologies can you know, make sure that, that this new wave of services that we're going to indulge in and develop habits around actually are you know, kind of good for us individually and families and countries and whatever. 
Awesome. Um, we're running out of time, so we're going to end it there. Um, thank you so much for being on stage with me. Thank you.